Hi, I'm JJ Ainsworth, and some of you may know me as Megalithic Maiden. I would like to discuss some interesting research I'm currently working on, and I will be doing some decoding of ancient symbols, which I find to be extremely interesting. And I've been fond of this type of study all of my life. I cannot start without thanking this brilliant lady, Maria Gambutis, whose work has greatly inspired me, and she is truly someone I admire as her work is extremely fascinating. I only discovered her books about two years ago, and I was shocked by her information, and I thank her from the bottom of my heart for all her hard work. Maria Gambutis was born in Lithuania on January 23rd, 1921, and she died February 2nd, 1994, sadly right before Gobekli Tepe was excavated. She was an archaeologist and anthropologist known for her research into the Neolithic and Bronze Age cultures of Old Europe, and for her Kurgan hypothesis which located the Proto-Indo-European homeland in the Pontic Steppe. Her work was criticized and suppressed, which is partly why I only found her work a few years ago. Her male colleagues argued against her theories, claiming they were wrong. But actually, it turned out she was exactly right. Three genetic studies in 2015 gave support to the Kurgan theory of Gambutus, regarding the Indo-European Urimet. According to those studies, Y-chromosome haplogroups R1b and R1a, now the most common in Europe, would have expanded from the Russian steppes. Gambutus' work, along with that of her colleague mythologist Joseph Campbell, is housed in the Opus Archives and Research Center on the campus of the Pacifica Graduate Institute in Carpinteria, California. The library includes Gambutus' extensive collection on the topics of archaeology, mythology, folklore, art, and linguistics. The Gambutus archives house over 12,000 images personally taken by Gambutus of sacred figures, as well as research files on Neolithic cultures of Old Europe. Joseph Campbell compared the importance of Maria Gambutus' output to the historical importance of the Rosetta Stone in deciphering Egyptian hieroglyphs. Campbell often said how profoundly he regretted that her research on the Neolithic cultures of Europe had not been available when he was writing The Masks of God. However, recently one of her biggest detractors actually gave an honorary speech at the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago on the topic of Maria and her works. In his lecture titled, Maria Redi Viva, DNA and Indo-European Origins, renowned archaeologist Lord Colin Renfrew, who had been one of Gambutus' most influential antagonists, concluded his lecture with these words, Maria Gambutus' Kurgan hypothesis has been magnificently vindicated. In the lecture, Rinfrew says Gambutus' Kurgan hypothesis about the spread of Indo-European languages from the steppes north of the Black Sea by invaders she called Kurgans was correct. Originally in use on the Pontic Caspian steppe, Kurgan spread into much of Central Asia and Eastern, Southeast, Western, and Northeast Europe during the mid-third millennium BC. Kurgan is a word of Slavic origin which refers to their characteristic type of burial mounds. Gambutus spoke of these as big man graves, arguing that they marked the appearance of a new cultural group in Europe, one that was patriarchal, patrilineal, and warlike. Before their arrival, the people Gambutus called Old Europeans buried their dead in communal graves with grave offerings indicating no great difference in wealth or status and no domination of one sex over the other. Kurgan mounds often contained a single human body along with grave vessels, weapons, riches, and horses. Gambutus argued that the Kurgan people introduced Indo-European language into the lands they conquered 
as well as new cultural systems based on domination of warriors and kings over the general populace, and the domination of men over women. She stated that the Kurgan invasions of Europe began about 4000 to 3500 BC and slowly spread from then. The last strongholds of the goddess were in Sardinia, Malta, Crete, and a few other places where the goddess held on much longer before being taken over by the male counterpart. The amazing hypogeum of House Cephliana in Malta, which is a little more than 6,000 years old, housed a goddess-type communal burial with a large amount of bones found inside including some very odd skulls as you see in this picture. This is not my image, it's from the internet, because I have not been able to gain access to the strange skulls to study them. So, this is the Great Seshat. If you've been in Egypt and saw the temples, you would have also seen her. She has many names, but my favorite description of her is Mistress of the House of Architects. And for sure, she is the one whom takes measure. With this goddess in particular, there are many layered meanings, and the ancients did this expertly and elegantly. Seshat was also known as the mistress of the house of books because she looked after the library of the gods and was the patron of all earthly libraries. She was also patron of all forms of writing, including accounting and sentence taking. Many people do not realize that it was actually Seshat who invented writing, and not her consort Thoth, but it was him that taught the people to write. It is interesting to note that she is the only female character who was actually depicted in the act of writing. I want to focus a little on Seshat's tools of measure and surveying. Her involvement in mathematics is without question as she was the mistress of the House of Architects. If you've been to Saqqara, you would have seen some of the most ancient measuring devices found so far, including the wooden cubit rod, which is in the bottom image. Please notice Seshat's headdress. Many people have different theories on what it is, such as a star, a plant, etc. After a lot of research, I have my own theory taking into account her role as a surveyor. Here we can see Seshat with her headdress clearly depicted as a star, and the horns are depicted by two snakes. Remember, snakes have many depictions in ancient history and even were sometimes depicted as measuring rods. It is thought that above the star are generally bull horns, but these horns may have originated from the crescent moon making Seshat at least partly a lunar deity. The other image was not put together by me, but was on the internet anonymously. It shows what many people believe her headdress to be. A big problem to deciphering symbols is that it is often thought by many that the objects in question, like for example Seshat's headdress, have only one meaning. But I have found that this is rarely the case. Sometimes her headdress was shown with different numbers of points on the star as well. Tools. About a groma. This roughly made groma in the yellowish center image was found during an excavation in the Fayum province of Egypt in 1899. Early surveyor instruments such as this were useful on flat terrain. With this tool, distant objects were marked out against the position of stones on a horizontal plane. The groma is the principal tool used by surveyors for simple and orthogonal alignments necessary to the constructions of roads at right angles to build cities, temples, and agricultural land subdivisions. The groma is thought to have been used in the 1st and 2nd centuries BC, but was without doubt used much, much earlier. The top image is an ancient cylinder seal from Mesopotamia, and it portrays a groma. And the groma is a very important part of the seal being located next to the powerful deity in the center of it. 
I think the deity is Inki, and I think it may originate from around 2300 BC or so. Seshat being involved in the pyramid is without question at Saqqara because of the buff image, and also because she was involved in the stretching the cord ceremony, which was conducted as part of the foundation rituals when erecting stone buildings. At Saqqara, the ancient measuring and surveying tool used in the construction of the pyramid itself is shown carved in relief. The bottom image portrays a Goroma surveying tool, which is a tool of Seshats, and I will discuss this in further detail soon. I took this photo while at Saqqara, and I was quite amazed by it. Many people have said this carving is a depiction of stars, and indeed it could be, but this is not the only thing it represents. The ancients were masters of elegance in their carvings because they used layered meanings. These multiple meanings meant less effort was used in the carving of hard stone. The star is also a groma, and both relate to Sesha as she surveyed not only the earth, but the stars, and the other heavenly bodies as well. If you still find it hard to believe that the image found at Saqqara is a groma, then please see this image comparison of a known Roman groma from the grave of an ancient mason or surveyor. This ancient groma, which is used as a measuring device and also doubles as a symbol of the ancient Egyptian deity Seshat. And this is without question. And it makes complete sense as she is mistress of the House of Architects, as I mentioned, and stone temples were erected always with her presence in the foundation ritual ceremony. The bottom left corner shows an ancient groma in use, and please note in the same image two stakes being hammered into the ground. Now please look at the large middle portrayal of Sesha and see she also holds these two objects in her hands. As she was a scribe, I believe these objects are again dual imagery showing both the scribe's writing tools and her architectural measuring tools. As mentioned, stretching the cord was one of the most important elements of the foundation ritual. From as early as the Second Dynasty, the ceremony was closely associated with Seshat. Because remember, as stated before, being the house of architect's mistress, she had to be there. So, if you're a Freemason or an Eastern star, you might recognize that the cord in the stretching the cord ceremony is the Mason's line which in this ritual was used to measure out the dimensions of the building and align the building with the stars or points of a compass. So let's compare the headdress of Seshat to the Groma star and again its placement near the god whom has measured out the rectangle plot above his hand. The star began as a female symbol but during the change over to a more patriarchal system these important symbols were taken over by male deities. Why do I say that the changeover did happen and that women were symbolic of time and measure? Women learned to count first and they were taught by their own bodies and there is an overwhelming amount of evidence for this. The oldest lunar calendars and earliest constellations have been identified in cave art found in France and Germany. The astronomer priestesses of these late upper Paleolithic cultures understood mathematical sets and the interplay between the moon's annual cycle, ecliptics, solstices, and seasonal changes on Earth. The archaeological record's earliest data relating to human awareness of the stars and heavens dates the Aurignacian culture of Europe from 32,000 BC. 
Alexander Marshak published breakthrough research that documented the mathematical and astronomical knowledge in the late Upper Paleolithic cultures of Europe. Marshak deciphered sets of marks carved into animal bones, and occasionally on the walls of caves as records of the lunar cycle. These marks are sets of crescents or lines. Artisans carefully controlled line thickness so that a correlation with lunar phases would be easy to perceive. Sets of marks were often laid out in serpentine patterns. Why do I think that women's bodies taught them to be the first counters? Let's look at the Venus of LaSalle. It is a limestone base relief of a nude woman. She was painted with red ochre, the color of the menstrual fluids, and she was carved into a rock shelter in southwestern France. The carving is associated with the Gravettian Upper Paleolithic culture dated at approximately 25,000 years. The Venus holds her crescent moon-shaped horn that is notched 13 times, which is the same amount of moons in a lunar year. Also, 13 is the day of the cycle when a woman can become pregnant. The ability to plan a pregnancy, especially during the cold, arduous journeys of the Paleolithic, could mean the difference between life and death. To survive, women listen to their biological clocks and learn from them. Here are more of these notched calendars that many call Venus figurines dating to almost 25,000 years ago with obvious feminine attributes which also is more evident showing that women were the first to count and measure. Although archaeologists sometimes label this as a simple Venus figurine, I believe it is something more. I believe it is a tool that has been around for a very, very long time, just not recognized. A very important surveying tool, and I will show you why, but let's jump back to ancient Egypt for a moment. The large image above showing several human figures is a representation of land measurement on the wall of a tomb at Thebes from approximately 1400 BC, showing head and rear chain men measuring a grain field with what appears to be a rope with knots or marks at uniform intervals and a man carrying a waz scepter. The waz scepter was a symbol that appeared often in relics, art, and hieroglyphics associated with the ancient Egyptian religion. It appears as a stylized animal head at the top of a long straight staff with a forked end. Scepters were depicted as being carried by the gods, pharaohs, and priests. However, I believe it was both a measurement tool and a symbol of power. It was part of the rod and ring kit of measuring devices. The rod and ring was known as the shin ring in ancient Egypt, which eventually evolved into the cartouche which held only the names of the elite. This wa scepter was a tool of measurement that gave humanity the ability to successfully farm and sustain themselves, which effectively extended and improved their lives. If you had the knowledge of measurement, then you had power. Okay, back to the image of Thebes. There is a wa scepter in it, and I'm curious why a man clearly not a person of extreme importance would be carrying this. I think it is there as a measurement tool in this instance. Please see the images below showing how the wasp scepter could have been used for surveying. I can easily say that many of the tools held by the elite in ancient times were related to surveying and were devices perhaps related to music and frequency, though having lost the meanings over time. The Wasceptor device has origins in the Upper Paleolithic Age and was associated with female attributes for thousands and thousands of years before the time of man. As I mentioned before, archaeologists sometimes label this almost 25,000-year-old artifact as a simple Venus figurine but it is so much more. I will be skipping back and forth on the topic of 
Egypt, so be prepared. Sashia is also associated with the feline and in fact was often shown wearing the skin of one, which I believe is also part of her imagery relating to the heavens and her ability to measure not only the stars, but to design, survey, and oversee megalithic constructions such as the Great Pyramids. Because the horns above her headdress star symbol may have at one point been a crescent, this firmly links Sasha to the moon and hence to her spouse, the moon god of writing and knowledge, Thoth. The spots on the feline pelts are often used in images as depictions of the stars and are associated with archaeoastronomy, like in images from the extremely ancient site of Chatelhoyak in Turkey which dates back to 9,500 years. The deity associated with this powerful feline had the ability to measure heaven and earth. She was an aspect of the great goddess, the Creatrix, the beginning of civilized society bringing Promethean-like knowledge to the people of earth in the form of the sacred fire. She gave knowledge of architecture, craft, farming, and sedentary, sustained life. The vase in the image is an ancient artifact from Argentina and it also uses the feline to portray the stars using the spots on the pelt. The imagery on the right from the 9,500 year old side of Chatelhoyak is almost exactly the same in that the spots on the pelts are used as goddess symbols relating to the heavens. This type of imagery is not unique to these two areas but is found around the globe as well. The lower middle image above shows the famous schist disc located in the Cairo Museum. The museum label calls this a lotus vase, but other researchers interested in the object say it is an advanced technology from a lost civilization. Perhaps they are both correct. Whatever its intended use was for in the beginning, I have no doubt it ended up as a relic that symbolically contained the fire of the heavens. Seshat gave humans a bank of knowledge and gave them access to the sacred and divine celestial fire, and this was remembered in symbolic form. The schistix may be an artifact from a bygone age that we do not know of, a lost civilization that was repurposed, but I don't know this for sure, nor does anyone else. It is for you to decide what to believe. This is an enlarged image of the vase from Argentina. And the feline in this case is actually holding a groma measuring device. Again, putting the groma with the feline and the goddess attached to it as an ancient surveyor like Seshat. The stars on the pelt represent devices, not just simple stars relating to the heavens. Here is a better look at the feline pelts from Chatelhoyak with the interesting star-like symbols. It is possible that in the very distant past there was an original goddess related to the things of measurement that became splintered over time, breaking off into many goddesses. The ancient goddess Seshat, Bat, Hathor were probably all one and the same originally. I'll touch on Hathor and Bat in a moment. The original goddess dated to and beyond the time of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. She spanned the globe and knew no restrictions to the width and breadth of her reach. We see evidence of her hidden in symbols from ancient sites across the world. She was in the heavens as a bird, and in the first image from Egypt she takes this hybrid form with a beaked face. And interestingly, in old Europe, as far back as 25,000 BC or more, the bird goddess has been the patron of music. Why would this be? Possibly because of the beautiful bird songs we hear. Again, she was in the heavens as a bird, on the earthly plane with humans as a feline, and on and below the surface as the moist fish, serpent, and frog. Now Bat, or Bata, was an ancient Egyptian cow goddess associated with Upper Egypt. She was originally a deification of the Milky Way, which was compared to a pool of cow's milk. Her name is the feminine form of the word Ba, the name of one of the major elements of the soul. 
She was associated with the Ankh, the symbol of life or breath, and with the Sistrum, which was also associated with Hathor. Her cult center was in Sheshesh, the seventh gnome of Upper Egypt, known as the Mansion of the Sistrum. I've noticed in my studies of these ancient cultures around the world that the number seven is generally associated with women, especially before the times of, say, 3500 BC. It is possible that Hathor and Bot were once one and the same because of their similar aspects. You can see how similar the symbol of Seshat is to the image of the very ancient Bot goddess. And Bot was a cow goddess, as was Hathor and possibly Seshat because of the horns in her symbol. Here again is the stylized groma with measuring sticks leaning up against it from a piece of proto-Egyptian pottery. Please compare it to the known Roman groma on the right. The goddess spread around the world with her symbols often remaining the same, but her names changing over time. Let's hop over to Ireland. The above image shows the goddess Bridget's cross. Bridget, or the exalted one, was the Irish goddess of spring, fertility, life, and motherhood. She was the master of both healing and smithing. Her holiday, Embalk, was held on February 1st and marked the midpoint of winter. She was involved with the calendrical system by way of equinoxes and solstices with the sun penetrating inside her temple, impregnating her with new life. Many of Ireland's wells and waterways were devoted to her. She was a member of the Tuatha Dé Danann. The Bridget, or Brid name, likely refers to the goddess's connection to sunlight and fire. But may also be related to dawn goddesses across the Indo-European world. Bridget is derived from the Proto-Indo-European root word for to rise or high. Bridget's crosses were traditionally set over doorways and windows to protect the home from harm. At the ancient site of Newgrange in Ireland, the goddess was built into the site in the form of a corbel ceiling. You can look at the cross of Bridget on the left and easily see the center design is the same as a section of ceiling inside the sacred structure. Many of her sites were mounds representing the womb, which is both the container of sacred fire and water, both together creating life. The sun representing sacred fire and her temple the amniotic water. This temple is why I say Bridget was clearly a goddess of measurement as well and another example of the goddess symbolically built into the temple. You will find many of the same symbols associated to the gray old goddess, and these will be symbols associated with womb, water, measurement, birds, particularly water birds and vultures, felines, serpents, boars, and many other animals. And in Anatolia, she was shown with a life column in the form of a tea pillar. The same thing occurs in Malta, where the bountiful and fertile mother deity shapes was the outline for the temple structure itself. This temple goes back to about 4000 BC. In the UK, this was also done in the ancient long barrow constructs. Bellis Knapp is a Neolithic chambered long barrow in Gloucestershire, England. Next to that image is Park Labrios in Wells, which is almost 6000 years old and it is also called a giant's grave. But I think it would be more appropriate to identify it with the grave of a giantess, as it is definitely a female site. The nude artifact on the right was found at Hagar Kim Temple in Malta, dating to 4000 to 3500 BC at least. Let's take a closer look and examine the arrangement of the inner chambers, as they are often of the same layout across the world, including Ireland, England, and Malta. We find these curvy, voluptuous goddesses in the earth everywhere. In England, in Europe, in Malta, in Turkey, and very specifically at the 9,500-year-old site of Chetelhoyuk. This Chetelhoyuk artifact 
was found buried in the earth, along with the one from Grimes' grave in England, and in the house of Fliani Hypogeum in Malta. Amazingly, we also have the same fertile, curvy goddess at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, dating back to an estimated 10,000 BC as well. She appears to be holding a skull, but this is not because she is a murderous old witch or hag, but it is showing her in the form of the dead goddess, taking part in the excarnation ritual at the site. And this ritual is another reason we see vultures carved on Pillar 43. The goddess of death took part in rebirth as well in the form of regeneration. In ancient times, the goddess of death was not feared, but was a natural part of the life cycle of every single living thing on the planet. Without death, there could be no rebirth. Without excarnation, there was no reincarnation. All of this gives evidence for the ancients believing the earth itself to be a fertile goddess of life, death, and rebirth, which is what goddess temples were all about. Looking closely at enclosure H on pillar 57 at Gobekli Tepe, there is another example of the goddess as the temple. According to Andrew Collins, we see two serpents holding what may be a decapitated skull forming a necklace. Now, below this necklace is what I say is a vulva symbol, the magical pubic triangle. The decapitated skull, or death, and the vulva, life and rebirth, again point to it as a female site. Let's compare the Gobekli vulva to the very obvious vulvas from the Lipinski Vir culture located in Serbia. The latest data suggests that the chronology of Lipinski Vir spans between 9500 and 6000 BC. The site is situated on the banks of the Danube River. Lipinski Vir buildings have a layout which is based on elaborate geometry of an equilateral triangle grid and 60 degree circle sections in the form of the female genitals. Again, these temples were the goddess herself. A sort of cult of the head or skull was also practiced at the site. Ritual burials included a strange practice of removing the skull from the head, then the mandible from the skull, before they were all buried separately. Skulls were placed in special stone structures. The skull would be placed on a larger stone slab than protected by crushed stones. The close-up images of the vulva depictions are strikingly similar. Without doubt, I cannot deny the possibility that the goddess was built into the tepe in Hoyek sites of ancient Anatolia. The T-shaped artifacts are found all across the world and point to old knowledge that was somehow shared around the globe in very ancient times. And what we see above are but a few remnants of that now lost universal entity information that was represented as T. Just a few examples of T symbols. And pictured on this T is the bird from Mesoamerica. And the bird is probably a wizened old owl, which is found everywhere in old Europe. Here is a tea from China. People believed in a close relationship between the human and supernatural worlds. This T-shaped silk banner summarizes this as it depicts the three scenes of the universe which were heaven, earth, and the underworld. Note the birds in the heavens, the felines in the middle area, though you will have to zoom in a lot to see them, as it's not a particularly clear image, unfortunately. And the serpent and fish makaras in the underworld portion. More examples of T-shapes representing temples from basically everywhere you look from the ancient world if you pay close attention. Turkey, 
Peru, China, Israel, Egypt, Anatolia, just everywhere. Again, these are but a few examples of the many artifacts showing the same thing. And these ones are really curious, as they all have the circle or dot attached to them. I'm honestly unsure what this means, but I'm thinking it may relate to either the navel, or the womb, or maybe the third eye. I just don't know, but I do know that it is significant. And with more study, I hope to eventually unravel its secrets. Here we see the ancient goddesses from the Indus Valley with the head shape of tea. This effectively solidifies the goddess association with the tea. I want to look more closely at the middle image from the last slide. On the left and right sides of the large object here, we have two scorpions, and in the middle we have the T-shape, while below that we have a headless body, sometimes also referred to as a frog figure. Well, why would this be? We have to go further back in time to understand what is being shown here. Perhaps the Gobekli Tepe vulture stone holds the answer. In the lower portion of the Gobekli pillar there is a scorpion, which is also on the Indus plaque. And this is interesting. There is a headless body on both artifacts as well as the scorpion. And there is a T-shape on the plaque as well. And of course, the Gobekli pillar itself forms the T-shape, making the Indus Valley plaque a descendant artifact of the Gobekli Tepe temple. On this T-pillar, it shows excarnations. If you look on the bottom corner of the pillar, you will see a headless body, and above in the middle of the stone, you will see a vulture. And at Gobekli's descendant side of Chattelhoyuk, you will see the imagery of the vulture actually participating in the excarnation ritual, which needs to occur before rebirth can. These sky burials or excarnation rituals still occur in some parts of the world today. Remember that the curvy lady carving was also found at Gobekli Tepe holding a skull in her hands. So it is pretty clear what this site may have been, at least one of its purposes anyway. In the funerary sphere of ancient Egypt, the scorpion goddess Serket helps the Egyptian solar god in his daily rebirth. She is a protector of the dead and also involved in healing, so she is a descendant aspect of the goddess from the Tepe sites participating in the life cycle via death and regeneration or rebirth. These goddesses, though partitioned off from the original mother, kept the exact same meanings throughout time because the goddess was very powerful and her symbols hold that power even still today. I'd like to mention that every single animal and symbol you find at Gobekli Tepe, which means Potbelly Hill or Navel, belongs to the old mother goddess and not to any male counterpart. Though men are very important and did play a significant part in the fertility aspect of the life column, shown are p powerful oryx, bulls, heavenly birds, snakes, venomous scorpions, boars, arachnids, and many other animals as well. The symbolism proves this temple was one of life, death, and rebirth. Gobekli Tepe is covered in serpents and in fact has a woman with the head of a serpent giving birth carved there. Serpents are firmly ensconced in the imagery of the woman for many reasons, from her umbilical cord to the soft wavy patterns serpents create when traveling across land and water. The same type of female serpent pattern is found at Karahan Tepe, Navali Chori, and no doubt will be found in the future at similar sites. A Chattelhoyuk on the east wall with six model breasts, each containing lower jaws of wild boars, 
image from Mellar 1967. If we go back to Gobekli Tepe, we see that the boar is depicted there quite prominently because of its part in death and regeneration. Please note that in the UK, such as at the female mound site of Hetty Pegler's Tump, boar jaws were found buried at the site. So these traditions lasted a long time. The artifacts with their H-shaped altars on Malta harken back to the ancestor site of Gobekli Tepe with its temples portraying the famous H depicted on the belts of the megalithic tea beings. These are life columns. We find this H carved around the world and on and at ancient sites of great importance. On the left and right, the crescents represent the moon, but if brought together, they form the egg, the cosmic egg, the full moon, the life, the lunar deity. These artifacts, stylized bags or baskets, are the descendants of the great civilizations of ancient Anatolia. They show the exact same symbolism found at Gobekli Tepe on Pillar 43, from the bulls to the serpents to the felines and the scorpions. These artifacts are but only a few of the many that exist from the giraffe culture of ancient Iran, and they are over 5,000 years old. In my mind, I do not see these artifacts as just decorative, but emblems of the great achievements in measurement, surveying, and architecture from the past. The bottom right images are of measuring tools, including the Groma and surveying kit, and portrayed are carriers of the tools used to construct, which is the bag or basket. Only one of the many meanings of the bag. All of this information proves the great goddess of the high places was extremely important in the ancient world. What may have influenced the building of temples such as Gobekli Tepe, pictured from afar in the lower image, to such an extreme degree could have been because of the after effects of the Younger Dryas event, which would have been felt far and wide. Perhaps they built these temples with such elaborate designs because the people were asking the goddess for help in their desperate time of need. Turkey is littered with these ancient temple structures dating back to these times. Though most people think there is only one or two sites, there are many. These temple locations are both natural and artificial mounds used to replicate a fully pregnant woman. And at these high places, it does look as if the earth herself has become pregnant. And with her mountainous swollen belly, she is ready to give birth and give rise to a new life cycle. What is happening in this image is very important. This bird is the old goddess being destroyed by patriarchy, the time when men and war began creeping in. I know this because I look closely at the symbols. The bird, as you all now know, was a symbol of the feminine from time immemorial, and it began a slow decline from about 4000 to 3500 BC, because this is when the warrior time really kick-started. It was the beginning of the time of men, and before the time of man, society was more peaceful and egalitarian as claimed by Maria Gimbutis. This is shown through research at very ancient sites where not much weaponry was found, and when it was found, it generally had to do with rituals or hunting. Please note the Star of Ishtar, Seshat, Inanna, etc., just by the bird's head. And let us also pay attention to the feet of the goddess with the claws are in the form of a symbol we can call the comb. The comb goes back thousands and thousands of years and is also shown with the goddess, particularly from old Europe, and it doubles as the claws of the vulture. Next, look at the object between the man and the goddess. It is called a fire altar on the label, but it should be more accurately described as the sacred fire which was also always guarded by the goddess in ancient times. This is the end of the old goddess ways. The same thing is repeated across the globe in which the design of a particular deity is built into the architecture of temples. You have only to look at the ancient artifacts to clearly see this. 
You see in the first large image, the center portion of him is an aerial view of the Pyramid of the Sun. And at the very peak is the ancient Chicana. I want to say that the ancient Chicana was definitely not just a pretty Central South American and Mesoamerican ancient design but was also a surveying device, but here I don't have time to go into it. But I will at some point put a video up on YouTube showing evidence for this. Seven was important in the ancient world, and here are a few ancient artifacts with one dating back past five, six, seven thousand years. Serpents with seven heads are shown in all these artifacts from across the world, and there are many, many more than these. The ones here come from India, Siberia, and Mexico, all associated with the gods and goddesses. And did you know that the goddess Seshat was known as She of Seven Points? Many of the ancient Egyptian temples have seven apertures, which is confusing to even Egyptologists. Perhaps it goes back to the old goddess. The Egyptian book of the Amduat from the New Kingdom tells how in the seventh hour, which takes place in the cavern of Osiris, the power of the scorpion goddess Serkat becomes a great help for defeating Apophis. The number seven held a special place in the minds of the ancients. What the seven represented to them is still unclear, but what we do know is that it was extremely important. It may have been a representation of a passage between the world of the living and the world of the dead. These seven types of artifacts were also in so many places, but they have to be closely looked for. The few here are from Karnak in Egypt, from the Etruscan peoples in Tarquinia, Italy, and from the Akapana Pyramid at Tiwanaku in Bolivia which had seven floors, and when you reached the top, you had access to the Chicana waters, which were bathed in by the moonlight and the sunlight, giving them healing properties of the goddess. So, we find the same symbols of the goddess in Siberia on portable stone walls, like the one in the above image. In fact, the exact symbol set is found on the egg stone at the ancient site of Newgrange in Ireland, which is no doubt a goddess temple, and it has alignment. Also we find the same exact pattern on small ancient depictions of bread, which in the past was associated with the goddess because of an oven's likeness to a pregnant womb, rising bread, and warmth. We find these stones especially stone spheres abundant from ancient Scotland. So, I also want to discuss the Schist disc, also known as the Disc of Sabu, which was in some of my previous slides. It's dated around 3100 BC, and Egyptologists insist that it was a simple lotus-style vase or candle holder, but it no doubt would have been extremely difficult to carve. Many people believe it is something more than a vase, perhaps something mechanical and technologically too advanced for that time. A technology we simply can't recognize or understand properly as of yet. It was discovered in the ancient site of Saqqara in Egypt, which is a very important place, including where the Steppe Pyramid of Djoser is located. How this was carved so delicately and precisely out of schist is unknown, and so the mystery of the disc lives on. So I'd like to thank you all very much for listening to this, and again, I'm JJ Ainsworth, the Megalithic Maiden. I'm a writer, uh, an explorer, researcher of ancient symbols. I'm on YouTube, of course. Um, Patreon, and I'd like to thank my um, current patrons for this as well.